thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I do come from the, the mystical land of Poughkeepsie, uh, which, with some of what I'm going to talk about, is going to sound a little less mystical by the end of this. Um, oh, but this is very much kind of where I come from. Um, this book kind of took a long time to write, and an interesting kind of weird arc to it, um, but we'll start the start and kind of end at the ending. Um, to, to talk about Nostradamus, I don't think is necessarily misplaced, considering it's dystopian landscape and we'll kind of end at the end of the world. Uh, but we'll start with a, a poem called Creation. A call comes in at ungodly hour, and two men whose duty it is report to an alley with its lamp shot out, an iron door, an iron door so long disused, its fuse to a piece with its frame, thin flashes moving on waves of trash, rats breathing over all. The younger of the two toes through broken glass, assigning names to the varied species of regret. It's the voice of the older one that recalls them to their purpose. The body in its repose, colder than the night is cold, glazed and blue like an angel beneath the dripping pipe. The older man has seen enough of this to sour the promise of retirement. The alley stage, the prop of the naked torso. <coughs> Excuse me. The prop of the naked torso. While the younger one is fixed, suddenly unto himself, by the clutch of mice nested in the hull of the dead armpit. Facts are logged, though not this fact, nor the distance between breaths, in which the iron door rediscovers its black magnetism, breaks loose and spins itself to some new gravity in its chest. The seas of glass rise up to cover it with light, continents of garbage lift and shuffle off. Another call is made to bring men from their beds, men who will lift the body with gloved hands, only to dump it further afield, the morgue full in the county afraid of overtime. The young man returns to the, to the precinct to work the case that will last beyond dawn, the intricate extensions of which he hadn't counted on, that long case with its breaks, immense and individual. weeks ago when we first met, uh, Danielle asked about the specificity of that poem and how familiar I was with that landscape and whether yeah, that was anything I'd actually seen. <laughs> that is New York. That's New York in the late 80s, early 90s. <laughs> a, a different, um, less friendly New York than we have now. Um, that poem, um, for all the specifics in it, is, is much less autobiographical than this one here, um, a poem called Early Lessons. I once was shown the proper way to cup a man's chin in the palm of my hand, reaching with the other hand to hold firmly the base of the skull, the way that I would later learn to hold the head of my wife, consoling to my chest. I was shown once, then again, how to force the head up and back to the point where the spine becomes a fulcrum, the brainstem levered free. All night I spent with a handful of other young men Two women engaged in obscure steps, a solemn contact, while outside palm trees in a courtyard whispered faintly as rain, and this, to me, was the strangest thing. I was 19 years old, in a city of my own choosing, and I was capable of anything. Performing the same maneuver more slowly, I was shown how the body will, of its own accord, roll at the shoulders until all balance is lost and each of us brought to our backs thus, learned what it was to feel the press of a knee against our necks, the darkness zeroing as the blood was held from our brains. Hours went by like this, bowing to each other, shaking hands, then working for the privilege of kneeling on the other's neck, getting up and shaking hands again. I recognized even then that knowledge like this would never save me so much as going the other way might. Even so, I was expected to train until it was automatic to kill a man, if that's even possible. I could still do it now, if that's what they meant. I went home that night not even stiff in the neck, not even full of myself, endowed though I'd been with his new grim power, only feeling perfectly lucky to be alone, aware of a new beauty and loneliness, 
I knew nothing of those other apprentices, would not fear for any returning home to lie with husbands, wives, or strangers. Some may have stroked their children's heads with those same hands, while others went straight to the bar to get them wet around a bottle. I was only grateful that, after showering, after sliding my able body naked into bed, I knew that I would find there no companion, no one likewise lonesome willing, I might, dreaming of deception, reach for in the night. So this book is um, broken into three parts, and I don't like to talk about what those parts are to me too much, um, usually, uh, because I never want to preclude anyone else from reading it a different way. Um, but the, the first part is at least has a lot of these kind of origin stories, uh, <coughs> almost about younger people or places where I uh, may have come from or that resemble the background I came from. Um, and the middle part, at least in my head, is, is just called bad romance. Um, there's just a lot of a lot of poems in which things go wrong uh, in a, interpersonal relationships. Um, there are other things going on, so I hope it doesn't ruin anyone's reading, but uh, yeah. for me it's bad romance. So I'm going to read a couple of those. Um, the first one is called Thrall. The second half of the story is Boy Loses Girl. Late summer comes in with its desiccated grass and the sabbat of small birds amassed voracious on his lawn, gone in a brown blink when his arm moves to the bedside stand for water. An hour gets lost with the paper, fumbling the combination lock of the date. It's fine, he thinks. It's fine to see how all that's possible betrays us. How we're promised the world is spontaneous, but wish for it only up to the point where the russet linen bunched in our fingers is her skirt and not the curtains drawn against the daily passers-by, the chilled orange at breakfast a semblance of her ice cube holding tongue. He traces each day's steps across this map of ghostly contacts, tries to recall the whispers of forbearance sloughing from their bodies like the hiss of that violet ribbon he pulled to release her black mass of hair, the liquid thrill of it breaking over her shoulders. The ribbon he finds later, disassembling their bed, his last day in the house, wearing a skin of dust like years of accumulated doubts. It's good, he says aloud then, to no one, to have known, to be held a time, to be undone. And then as much as late 80s, early 90s New York was kind of the backdrop for my childhood, um, overlaying upon that is kind of a history of uh, living inside comic books, um, which from a certain age to another certain age, I, I spent a lot of time in. Um, and all of the superheroes lived in New York. It was amazing. It was, it was just a, an extra thing when you're, when you're getting and going on and getting on trains when you're 12 years old to have that kind of living in the back of your head. But that's a part of the mythology of the landscape of where you live. Um, it's kind of fun. It's the, the kind of reason why when you meet uh, New Yorkers, they are extremely arrogant. They think they live in the center of the universe. And it's because all the superheroes live there. Um, uh, and that kind of creeps into this poem a little bit. This is called The Year in Which Our Hero Fails. The year in which our hero fails is better than most. Spring is bright and clear. The trains pull in on time. And when, in June, he stumbles off a high-rise, the idiot's near sacrifice endears us to him further. You spend whole afternoons in the new museum before the opening exhibits get shipped back to their permanent homes. Stocks soar on the prospect of less filling beers, and bars tremble with the groans of the stools. When he slips again in August, we watch the frame-by-frame frame piece from bystanders' phones, then a still of the thieves' helicopter banking safely towards Newark. After seeing it a thousand times, we start to think that they were the heroes. How, otherwise, could we stay so long? The jukebox soon will die, a blonde draped over it, and the barman who's been feeding you drinks since you were 16 will drive you home down streets you can't differentiate. All the closed storefronts the same, the scene a diorama that a hand might pull you from. Somewhere you find the presence to say, wasn't my hero. Nobody was. 
shut the car door, fumble your apartment keys. All through autumn, no friends call, and you don't call them to meet for lunch in the atrium between Bronze Age armors and UFOs. You can feel the cells turning over, blood going out red and coming back blue, like the lover you've missed, then stop missing one day in the vestibule of primordial migrations. November, the year our hero couldn't live up to his crest and cape, his alter ego's tie and tails, no weather to tell, no master box or last minute escapes, just echoes of his fall in every taxi's wake of air, the sideways rush of blood of the wall's vacant displays. All at once, it seems, you've forgotten what they held, what they held off, why you spent so many serious hours there. One more poem from this book. I'm going to read a couple of new pieces tonight, uh, which the world has not seen at all. Uh, so that'll be harrowing for me, and it won't make a difference to you. But um, I am going to read uh, one more from here. Like I said, this poem, uh, this book starts with that poem, Creation Myth. Um, I wrote this book over the course, really, of about 15 years, from the earliest poem in it to the, the last one. This is literally the last poem that I wrote for the book. Um, and once I did suddenly something snapped together um, and I reordered everything and I ended up with the structure that ended up being the, the final order of the book. Um, and without this poem, it would have looked different, had a whole different order, a um, whole different set of poems in it. it was, uh, this really made a change. Um, this poem is called At Ragnarok. Um, and the one thing I will mention, because it's odd, um, is there is a facet of the, the Ragnarok myth, the end of the gods in uh, Norse mythology, uh, in which the, the dead in the underworld right now are building a boat out of um, all the toenails and fingernails that they can collect from the dead bodies that are buried over the course of time. Um, it is a really weird kind of footnote in the Ragnarok myth. Um, and it's there, and I reference that. In there. And it's true because it's on the internet, so you can look it up, and it's definitely real. Um, at Ragnarok. When the milk is nearly weightless, and even our bread can't hold itself together. And words I use are built upon the premise that words fail. When my steel strings have gone in hock, my spacewalk suit and gift for flight, my second sight and half of my tattoos. When one crow of two remains behind to chatter from my shoulder while I beg for news of myself in the parlor of your solar plexus. It seems the dead have finally completed their foretold labor. A dragon ship, fashioned entirely from the toenails of the buried, has drawn up on our lawn, under the stunted cherry, to shiver like mother of pearl in the final whispers of ancient stars. There must have been a moment when one soul stood alone, rough hammer in his hand, a silk bag in the other, already sagging with odd materials. Did he think to ask the uncaring air, how should I begin? Or simply feel the measurable weight of the hammer, then turn to explain the task to his bewildered massing shipmates. Yes, the bread has grown into its late stage of crumbs. The milk has shrunk before the fridge's radiating bowl. Neither tonight will be restored. Still, your heart winds steady, its familiar humming spring, Beneath it, the dream of a daughter quickens. My second tattoo returns with good word. The world doesn't end at all. Um, and this book really, in a lot of ways, is, is the book of, of my 20s. It was published in my early 30s, but it's been written uh, largely through my 20s. And by the end, um, that last poem um, actually predates my, my oldest child being born. I'm, I'm writing poems now in whatever world this is that we're living in right now um, with a lot of anxiety like many of us are, um, but not just based on our, uh, I believe there's a lot that's cyclical in, in society. Um, and so I believe that things are always bad, basically. Um, but in terms of raising children, suddenly having to ask, how do I raise children? Um, and there's, there's violence in my past and how to speak about 
um, the violence that it came from, the violence that the landscape was, um, among very, very many other things. The, the life of fear that I now live having children and uh, knowing that in many cases there is just nothing I can do to watch them all. Um, so that's where a lot of these poems are coming from. I'll, I'll read a couple of these newer poems and, and then get out of your way. Um, and um, the first poem I'm going to read, read is called The Poet of Seventeen. Um, the title and a lot of the structure of which I have stolen from the much, much greater than I am poet, uh, Larry Levis. Um, he has a, a, Larry Levis died in 1996, and that's referenced in this poem. Um, but his poem, titled The Poet at 17, starts, My youth, I hear it mostly in the long, volleying echoes of billiards in the pool halls where I spent it all, extravagantly, believing my delicate touch on a cue would last for years. Um, and Levis comes from, a, he grew up in the Central Valley in California, a totally different landscape for me, references all these farming things that I have no idea about. Um, and, and I just took it and kind of ran with it. Um, so this is my poem, The Poet at 17. My youth, I see it mostly in the sure decline of quarters and the dull and bright arcades where I spent it all religiously, committing habits and patterns to reflex to extend my future gains. Outside, the asphalt's rain steamed off while floodlights shied or seemed to make their peace with the cover of cars holding couples up who leaned on each other, wondering how to leave. The next day, they'd plot the paucity of hours spent in the same theaters, cinematic aspirations orphaned on their tongues. Even then, they questioned, how to occupy the years that spread before them. When the poet says there were fields he disked, I don't know what it means, even though I know I lived some equivalent boredom. And these days, you have to make a choice to remain this ignorant. Anyone can find video of tractors indolent turning, pesticides and enacting their controls at lapsed time. Or a 17-year-old in a field and throws in Sausalito or Medjugorje. It didn't matter then, in Poughkeepsie, in New York, in 1996, when the poet I never met and loved anyway, but did not love yet, died. By the standards of the place, I was dying too, though he had a 30-year head start. The night I drove a car into the pedestrian-saving pylons of the mall, then walked to the motel where I hoped the police wouldn't find me, at least until I'd slept it off. Of course I could see it coming. There were people in that town who knew already they'd never leave and who pitied me the absence of a god. I practiced the turn of the wrist against the assurance of death and I don't even know what a kind of triumph would have looked like to play the game to its end or prolong the play. The hours churned and I went unseen. The stars fell in broken elements. It rained or didn't rain. A life like that, it seemed inexorable, running quarters down to nothing, then credit at the bar, the vacant three lanes through downtown, light pollution, asphalt. But mostly now I remember the roar of gates in the mall that closed, a fatal post team pulling the plugs on machines around me, and then the night air like the breath of two people filling space enough for one the inveterate locks, and then the neighborhoods I posted, window, windows like dead amusements, and games I never played, and how determined houses clutched their lawns, although the nights were short, and nothing was in doubt. Every 4 a.m., the confrontation with a door, the grocer's bag crooked in one arm, and keys somewhere to reach the final stairs and the night married of stairwells and halls. I'm always two fingers of whiskey away from sleep, whiskey or most of a beer, and also the oranges zested, olives pitted and quartered, then the strata of seven spices laying in a small glass bowl. I've got no mind for the sacred left, by the time I cut to cubes the flesh of the pig who gave its life for this, 
the meal I'll set to cook all day, and which my family will eat when I'm gone. Once, I spent such mornings watching hawks above the marsh, carry nesting and carry sparrows to the height of the eastern cypress. How luxurious were the violences in my life then, theoretical, plumed with metaphor. Now, my children, when they see me, ask when they'll see me again. I think of them when a squatter on my third patrol asks, hey, what's good? When he shows me his tow hook, three links of chain and heavy block, when he tells me, better not. Nothing says it has to be good. I want to warn my daughters. Just look at these nights I count off a private company's circuit of demands, carry humans from one spot to wherever else, carry a tiny book to record the threats against me. My daughters wake to find me in their mother's bed, wearing soft clothes against custom, my mouth venting alcohol. They climb atop me to quell with their weight the dreams in which I'm savage. I wake long enough to watch them disappear in bright coats and daylight, too far grown for the hours I've known. I once spent such mornings as this upright, and perhaps of no more good to us watching sunlight scourge the frost above terrified mice in the grasses. The violence of my place was nothing to me then, as I diced roots, dropped minuscule spoons of paprika, cumin, cayenne, as I reduced red wine, but doesn't escape me now, when I leave a house empty but for splendid smell, as I render the sacrificial cow sweet and unrecognizable. deep into the trees will be too deep to start the story. We awoke one night to the woods on fire, but first my daughter walked the yard, a basket on her arm collecting pine cones. The trees right up to the edge of where we lived, black earth and easy air, out of which an arrow fell. After which we each felt differently, the way the, earth, the, way the air would never still, after which the woods had burned but not before a second girl, so that the two shared a room a time, two tents of lamplight, where I told them stories I thought could hold them together, out of which they woke one night to heat they could feel through the window and the sound, that, and the sound of fire that always seems to have a voice in it if we could hear. There was one story I never told of how I'd sworn once at their mother well before they were born, how she swore back then spent three nights drinking in the city. I've known apology, is what I'm saying. After which, our bodies softened, our every scrap of iron soul, and like runaways we kissed, in a place warm to the touch yet from its fabrication. Evenings we rode the ferry to see the birth of electric light, and what had been violent in me was quiet for a time. I buried it beneath the floor of a house we'd never finished buying. This is a family history. Of course there are nails driven into it, so hard they split the wood. This may also be a history of the woods, as far as we know it, where the woods grew up to the edge of where we lived until the night they burned. Another way to say it is, my daughter's love for me became a room full of trees in which the trees have all been burned. How can I even hope to? How deep into the trees is too deep to start the story in which there are any trees at all? How do we live out what we are? The series of mistakes, an arrow bound to the yard, each of us gone at some time into night alone, and returned if we return. Fire rattle, sleep bomb, to those who share our story, to be taken in our new form, loved and whole and haunted.